So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm going to, uh, to talk about uh, hardware hacking and especially uh, uh, about methodology. So for those who don't know me, I'm uh, uh, the head of research at uh, Econocom Digital Security in Paris. I'm basically uh, what we can call uh, a hardware hacker, but uh, at least I'm pretending to be one, but uh, I'm not an expert in this field. Anyway, uh, I spoke at various conferences, and I have a special interest in uh, the Bluetooth Low Energy Protocol since uh, uh, two years now. So let's start. So what this talk is not about. So this talk is not about a, it's not a detailed reference guide on how to pawn uh, IoT devices. I won't give you uh, all, the, all the tools and all the methods to, to hack IoT devices, but I, I will go through uh, um, a specific process to analyze these devices. So it's a more, than a, more guide than a uh, how-to tutorial, if you see what I mean. So I won't give any list of tools you may use to, to test devices. So it's all about how to think and uh, analyze and exploit IoT devices. So it's based on uh, various previous works. We are going to, to see this. So what I'm proposing is to do it the hacker way, you know, by uh, applying the same hacker principle, principles to, to this stuff. So uh, I'm going to talk about methodology mainly. Uh, of course, there are existing methodologies. Uh, one uh, Rapid7 design, and um, I guess uh, Daryl Hayden talked about it uh, last year at in Paris. So uh, it inspired me to, to create my own methodology, adapted to what, I'm, uh, what I see, usually see during my, my pen test and my research. And of course, there is also the OWASP IoT project, which is a great project from the Open Web Application Security project uh, about IoT, but it's not uh, that mature, you know. Um, they still have to, a lot of work to, to do to, to, to provide a, a very... Uh, uh, a complete methodology to, to edit IoT devices. So I, I took all of these uh, methodologies. There are obviously more methodologies, but I, I did not mention them on this slide. So I took all of these methodologies and created my own, my own mix uh, that I, uh, I have tested uh, since uh, two years uh, at Econocom Digital Security. So basically, what is the process? Um, first, we start from the PCB itself. So we are going to see how to analyze a printed circuit board, so, but uh, the, the basics of uh, the hardware hacker uh, reverse engineering skills. And then we are going to have a look at the components on this board uh, to see how it, re how it, how it interacts and how everything uh, works at the uh, electronics level. Then we are going to extract uh, some data from these components, uh, say uh, some kind of firmware, for instance, or even data. And then we are going to analyze this data. If it's uh, some kind of, uh, uh, of code, we are going to disassemble it uh, and generally, more generally analyze this, uh, this data. Obviously, we can do a lot more with this PCB, PCB stuff. We can analyze uh, all the components and especially how the components interact with, uh, all the, with, uh, with other components. So this can be done with uh, specific tools. We are going to uh, have a very quick look at it in this, uh, in this talk. And obviously, how to uh, analyze wireless communications. Because you know, IoT, uh, IoT devices are designed to, for more, most of them, to communicate with uh, wireless protocols. So uh, we, all, we also cover this, uh, this uh, in, uh, in our method methodology. And of course, we are going to find vulnerabilities and attack these devices using these vulnerabilities we found. So just to, to illustrate this methodology, I'm going to, to analyze this uh, smart lock. So it's a BLE smart lock, Bluetooth low energy based uh, smart lock. It uh, was crowdfunded in France. And uh, uh, I don't think there are so many of these smart locks uh, in the wild. So this is why I chose this. Uh, this smart lock. So it's uh, quite interesting to see what we can do with, the, with this smart lock. So, so let's start. Uh, first step, the teardown. Uh, we are going to open uh, this, uh, this smart lock and uh, see what, it's, what, uh, 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 what uh, is inside this smart lock. So what, what do you need to open a, a smart lock? You need some uh, screwdrivers and uh, spudgers. So this is all, these are small tools. Uh, plastic tools, very useful to open uh, uh, you know, little boxes, uh, 
if you, I'm sure, I'm quite sure most of you uh, who made this or, or tried to, to open some boxes uh, use your nails and broke your nails with, the, with these boxes. So these tools uh, avoid that. It's uh, pretty awesome. And here it is, our brand new smart lock open. As you can see, there is not so much uh, inside, uh, only a PCB and some wires, obviously a motor to, to drive the, the opening and uh, closing of the lock, but uh, that's all. So let's have a look at it. Ah, yeah, just a, a, a single tip when you try to open boxes, keep calm, you know? Because sometimes you want to, to be a bit, you want to, um, you may be rude and try to, to open it very, you know, very quickly with bad tools, so it can, uh, uh, it can happen sometimes to break uh, the PCB when you are opening. Second step, the global, global approach or global analysis we can do to, uh, to discover the PCB. So basically, this is a, uh, a step uh, I usually do at the at first time uh, when I get the PCB, my hands on the PCB. So this idea, the idea behind this, uh, this uh, analysis is to uh, exploit some weaknesses uh, electronics engineers usually do. Uh, I mean, uh, when you are designing a PCB, uh, you have habits, and this is normal. This is uh, the way the, the engineers design PCBs. So basically, the components are placed based on, the, on their role, you know, because if you place two components too far, for one from the other, you have to route all the tracks uh, on the PCB, and uh, it implies a lot of trouble, a lot of issues when doing this. So basically, when you create a PCB, you place components that have uh, some kind of interaction uh, very close one to the other, just to be sure that you have the smallest track to connect them. So that means every component related to a specific function will be in the same area. Also, connectors and components producing heat, so basically uh, um, some uh, spe very specific components uh, are going to be placed near the edges because uh, it's easier to put a, a, a heat dissipator and, so, uh, and also to, to put a, a, some kind of connectors to connect to, to the system. So if we have a look at the, our smart lock, it's uh, very easy to, to spot all of these, uh, these components. So obviously, there is a micro USB connector on the, on the right of the, of the screen. Uh, at the bottom, two connectors for the battery and the motor itself. At the top, another connector for the second battery. And uh, there is something weird uh, between, uh, in between the, some kind of uh, components with uh, only four pins uh, available. So we're going to see what, uh, what this connector, which is not here, obviously, uh, is for. If we have a look then at the components themselves, we may find the Nordic Semiconductor 52832, which is uh, basically a 2.4 gigahertz Bluetooth low energy capable system and chip. So it's a full system, um, able to communicate with uh, the BAD protocol, so it's uh, quite interesting. And also, uh, DRV8848, uh, made by Texas Instruments, which is basically a motor driver. So this is a component in charge of driving the DC motor used to open or close the lock. So this is quite interesting, because I, I found this on the internet. So use Google, using Google, you can just put the references and get all the data sheets online. And you, it's very easy to, de to determine the, the role of these components. So if we uh, summarize on, uh, a bit this, uh, the, this PCB, so basically we, we have um, a lot of components related to battery. Uh, the, the, this is the area in blue uh, on the screen. Uh, related to motor, well, the area in orange, and BAD in, uh, in purple. So it's, uh, it, it took me only uh, five to 10 minutes to get this, to know how the PCB was, was designed and where the components are placed. So uh, just using Google and, uh, and mine, my brain, just uh, obviously. And then we can try to recover the schematics. The schematics is basically the, uh, the electronics design uh, made to, to create this PCB. And to get, to get uh, this schematic back, we are going to use some uh, pictures, high-resolution pictures, and uh, some dedicated software. 
just to, to, to get it back. So this is a, a very funny way to do, to do this, because uh, using just uh, some kind of, uh, uh, of ca um, high-resolution camera, you can just uh, take, the, um, take a picture or photo uh, of your PCBs, uh, the two layers, so front and back, and then follow the tracks and various uh, only uh, by using some kind of software, uh, dedicated software, image processing software. And based on this, we are going to be able to determine protocols, what, which protocols are used uh, for inter-integrated circuit communication. So uh, let's do this with uh, some kind of uh, example. So the main, the goal is to draw a simple and simplified schematic, uh, schematics for, from all of this stuff. So basically what I did is I took two pictures in the front and the back of the PCB, and uh, I used the uh, Inkscape, the Inkscape vector graphics software, to import this, this, uh, these pictures and using some uh, opacity settings, just uh, put one onto the other and see if uh, I can get where the vias are going through. So if you have a look, uh, just here, the, the, this is the NRF uh, 52. And then we got uh, four vias that go through this chip. And I can see clearly on this where it's going to. So it's pretty interesting to, to know what, uh, how the, how this, um, this, uh, this, uh, this chip is uh, connected to the DRV88, the other component that drives the motor. Um, and based on this, once you know uh, which pins, which, which uh, pins of uh, each uh, chip is used to, to communicate uh, uh, with, uh, with others, you can determine what protocol is used based on the data sheets. So the data sheet states that, uh, for instance, uh, pins 26 and 25 are used for the SWD protocol, which is a debugging protocol. And uh, if we have a look at uh, this, so the 25 and 26 pins are here. And then we can see, clearly see that th there are some tracks going to this connector. So there is uh, a great chance that this connector uh, should be uh, or may be used to debug this, uh, this chip. And then, using some uh, uh, software like Inkscape or Adobe Illustrator, Visio, or whatever, you can draw um, a simplified schematics. Uh, this idea, um, the idea behind this uh, schematics or this, uh, this, um, this schema is to, uh, to get uh, only the interesting stuff. We don't want to counterfeit this, uh, this PCB, so we only need to know where, uh, where we can connect and how these uh, chips Inter, um, communicates with uh, each other in order to understand how the PCB uh, was made. So this is uh, the final result I made with the Inkscape. So as you can see, my Inkscape skills are awesome. I'm very good at, uh, the, at drawing, but anyway, the, 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 the main, my point is here to, to be able to, to draw something like this. So uh, there is the debug port, the N52832. Uh, which is a Nordic semiconductor uh, 2.4 gigahertz uh, chip, and the uh, chip that drives the motor. And so it's basically connected to this uh, connector, and that goes to the motor. So, and I, I, I had determined the protocol used to communicate with these chips. Uh, this is basically a PWM, so it's pulse-width modulation. And uh, uh, I got the, 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 main, the main functions of, uh, of this PCB, so it's, uh, we are good to go. Yeah, as I said, uh, it was uh, quite amazing. Uh, and then we can go to get the firmware. So the NRF52832 uh, contains some kind of code. There is a, a specific memory in it that stores the program, uh, or some kind of code uh, used to create the BLE device and uh, uh, manage the lock, to, uh, just to say it uh, very, very simply. So if we get our hands on this firmware, we can get a lot of information. Maybe some keys. Maybe uh, um, we can determine how this uh, uh, smart lock works. Maybe some kind of backdoors if we can uh, reverse engineer this, uh, this firmware. So we are going to use a, um, a way, a very simple way to do this uh, by using the debugging interface. So previously, I, I determined that the uh, four pin connector near this uh, NRF52 chip is a, a debugging port. So uh, I'm going to use it to, to extract the firmware. I am using it with, uh, combined with OpenOCG, which is a dedicated software, you know, open source software uh, on, uh, available on Linux and Windows. And by using OpenOCG, I can just debug the target and obviously extract the firmware back. 
and get, the firm, get my hands on the firmware because there is absolutely no protection enabled on this uh, smart lock. So anyone can just get uh, the firmware back from the chip. So this is, uh, this is quite interesting. But sometimes, you know, debugging is not enabled. You don't have access to this uh, kind of feature. But uh, there is uh, also another feature that may be interesting, which is OTA. OTA stands for over the air. Uh, and this is uh, used, uh, usually used to, to perform updates of the firmware for, for a given device. So if we get, uh, if we find how the OTA update works, maybe we can find on the server uh, the, the content of the firmware that is be, uh, that's, uh, uh, the OTA feature used to, to put it on the device. So uh, uh, this screenshot uh, I'm showing you here is the exact firmware of the OTA function a feature of the uh, smartphone application that came with, uh, uh, with this smart lock is using to, to, put, in, uh, to put inside the, the, firm, the, the device. So basically, it's uh, base64 encoded, but uh, you can get it very easily. So based on this, uh, I got two versions of the firmware, one extracting from the device itself, and then another one extracting from the, uh, the remote server. Or you know, if, you have a, uh, if you don't have uh, the uh, OTA feature available or a uh, debug port, you can dump uh, every, every available storage device. So sometimes we got a TSERP 48 flash chip, and we can chip off, uh, I mean, uh, remove the chip from the PCB by using some uh, desoloring techniques, and then dump the contents of this, uh, of this flash chip. Anyway, at this, uh, at this moment, you will get your hands on the firmware, and we can just have a look at the X code. Uh, with an hexadecimal editor to see if uh, the firmware means something to us. And obviously, the one, one very easy way to do this is to, have, uh, to search for strings, for text strings. And here, I, I guess we get something interesting uh, because we are debugging information uh, with debug messages. So there are a uh, good chance to uh, we, we get the, the, the correct firmware uh, extracted from the device. So. When you're extracting um, information from some flash chips, you got to be very careful because uh, you, you will get not only the, the data stored in the flash chips, but also uh, what they call spare area or spare data. Spare data. This uh, is uh, additional space add, um, added to the flash uh, memory storage uh, to keep uh, to get rid of uh, errors because flash chips uh, are usually prone uh, to errors. And uh, they are using uh, mainly uh, ECC uh, to, to fix this error. This is some kind of uh, uh, correcting codes. And uh, uh, you got to, uh, to remove this uh, out-of-band data, this area, to, to start uh, working with the, the flash dumps you made. So uh, I'm not going uh, to, to cover this extensively, because uh, there are many, many, many cases uh, in which, uh, um, which we can be in trouble. With, but uh, in fact, this is a step you should not forget uh, to, to perform just after uh, dumping a flash. Based on this, we are going to determine the target architecture. So the idea behind this is to be able to, to determine how the targets work. And basically, you have to, run to ask you uh, three questions. The first one is, what architecture is this? Is this a, a full operating system? The, I mean, a, a Linux embedded system? Or is it a, a, what we call a, usually call a dumb device based on a microcontroller or, or system on chip, a very basic system on chip? So does it run an OS? And does it use a file system? If uh, it uses a file system, we can get the file system from the flash chip, for instance. So in my case, uh, for the smart log, this is, uh, uh, this is based on the ARM Cortex-M0. So this is ARM v7-M. Uh, this is a CPU uh, this uh, device relies on. And does it run an OS? Absolutely not. You, you cannot expect a, a Linux system on it. You cannot expect some kind of, uh, of uh, elf, uh, elf executables. So the only thing you're, you're going to get is just a blob of data based on this. So obviously, no file system at all. Uh, this is a, another story. Uh, a lot of people are used to analyze uh, um, Linux embedded device, devices by uh, just dumping the flash, get, back, get, get the file system back, and analyze all the, these binaries. But uh, in fact, this is not the case in, uh, with this smart log. We got to, to go deeper just to, to, get all, um, to get what we need. So no, no file system. Um, 
more specifically, since it's a non-semiconductor chip, it's based on what they call the soft device. Uh, what's, uh, uh, what is a soft device? This is a, uh, some kind of proprietary code that Nordic semiconductor ships uh, to, to developers uh, that embeds uh, a BAD stack. So this is uh, this, uh, this code, this soft device code that will handle all the BAD stuff. And the application is just a, a sort of plugin to this code. And your application is called by the soft device that acts like the bootloader. So, First of all, we need to get back the version of this soft device. So since we have some text strings in this, uh, in this device, it's very easy to get the, the version of the SDK. Have a look at this. Huh? The, slash home, slash Benoit, slash workspace, and RF51, firmware SDK, SDK 13.0. Oh. OK, I got the, the version. So next step is to go to, go to the Nordic Semiconductor SDK download page and get the correct version of it. So. We are going to see this in the next, uh, next step. So to, just a quick reminder, it, it, if it runs an OS or use a non-fi system, you'd better uh, drop binaries you find uh, in IDA Pro. So it's an uh, idea. It's very, very useful for this. And we'll handle this very easily, because there, is, there are metadata in the, file, in the executable itself. So this is, uh, this is not the case here. Uh, and if it uses absolutely no file system and looks like a crappy blob of data, you'd better figure out the architecture and memory layout. And you get this from the data sheets. Once you get all of this, you can disassemble the, uh, the program, the, the, the code that is uh, located in the, uh, the flash dump we made. So this uh, is going to be a bit rough, but uh, anyway. So to get this working, you get to configure the CPU in uh, your disassembler software correctly in, uh, accordingly with the data sheet. So we saw that this is based on the ARM v7. So we are, we are going to, to use this uh, information we get to, uh, to disassemble correctly this, uh, this code. And uh, you get to configure your memory layout uh, if, if it's required. In my case, uh, there is a, a soft device so if, um, I, I don't want to analyze this soft device. This is not my, the, the, my focus on this, uh, this analysis. So uh, I'm going to start at the application level. So if you remember well, there is some kind of uh, soft device and application level. So I, I got to get the app and, uh, underscore code underscore base, which is the address at which my first instruction, well, mainly, uh, mostly is with an offset, but uh, I will find my, my first instruction. So let's go over it. Um, we use, uh, obviously, IDA, we set up the ARM v, uh, v7, so this uh, tiny button here. And then we can set the uh, processor options uh, and get it uh, to disassemble the code. So here is the next track of the disassembled code. As you can see, there, there are some string references uh, in the code. So that means it means something. Uh, this is not a crappy code or just uh, some kind of uh, bytes that, that, has been, uh, that have been uh, disassembled. So it's uh, quite interesting. And to automate this, uh, this process, we developed uh, many tools uh, just to, to ease the task of uh, reverse engineering, and especially for Nordic semiconductor devices. So we developed a software, I'm going to show you very quickly how it works, uh, to first be able to determine the, soft, the SDK version and the soft device version they are using. So it's based on some kind of uh, signatures. We have a knowledge base uh, we, we created from all the versions of the SDK. And then uh, we are able to identify this, uh, this version. So basically, you can see here, we got the version 6.1.0 so, uh, on a, a 51. So this is not the same firmware I'm using. So this, uh, this is different, but it's normal. Uh, we use this, uh, this tool against, uh, against this firmware to, go to analyze it. So, and basically, when, once we, you get all the correct information, you can just put it uh, in IDA, uh, put all, the, all of this information, disassemble the code, and ask our plugin to recover the names of the functions. So if you have a look at the, the left of the screen, uh, it's written in tiny, tiny font, but uh, it's a sub underscore something. And by executing our plugin, we get all the function exported by the soft device. So it's very easy next to search for cross-references and then reverse engineer the, the application. So this is uh, available on GitHub, of course. 
it's also interesting to have a look at the mobile applications too. So if you want to, to get some information, uh, yeah, here about the signature of the firmware used in the smart lock. So it's uh, quite interesting to, to disassemble everything. Uh, the more information you, get, you, you, you will have, the more easier the, yeah, the, the, easier the, the analysis will be. And uh, step seven, sniff all the things. Get a lot of information. So basically, how, we, how do we perform this? Uh, in, you may need uh, various hardware, uh, especially if you try to sniff uh, electronics protocol. I mean, uh, SPI, I2C, which are uh, inter-chip communication protocols. So it's, um, it's useful. Sometimes you get to be able to, to sniff BAD devices, uh, BAD protocols. So uh, you, can, you also may need some kind of dedicated hardware, such as the Ubertus BTLE, or, or maybe uh, uh, some other tools, uh, such as uh, the one we developed with uh, uh, a digital security, which is, which is called a bitter juice. Uh, I know some people here are, sort of, went to the to Slavomir's training, so maybe they, are, uh, they, um, they have heard about Gattaker, which is another tool. Uh, obviously, mine didn't work during the training, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, but anyway, this is a, a way to, to perform this uh, BLE, uh, uh, BLE sniffing and BLE analysis uh, on, this, uh, on this device. So, uh, this is what I, I've do, uh, what, I, what, I, what I did on this device to, to get all of this, and I, it allowed me to uh, understand how the device works and how the communication works between the application and the, the device itself. So basically, what you can see here that the, um, we can see that the application retrieves uh, N1s from the lock which is basically used for uh, other crypto. Then the app encrypts a token based on the, on the uh, N1s and the data itself, uh, which is a, a token uh, sent to the lock to open it or close it. And then the lock decrypts the token and reacts accordingly. So if we ask the lock to open, it will open if the token is, is, is valid. And uh, if we ask uh, the, uh, the smart lock to, to close, it will close if the token is still valid. So, it's not, um, not that complex, but uh, it's quite interesting because uh, if you have a look at the, the system, the cryptographic uh, system is well designed, well thought, if you, if you, if you see what I mean. It's, um, uh, it avoids normally uh, replay attacks. By the way, if you have a look at the apl mobile application, we can see that uh, this application detects the smart lock only uh, based on the service UID. So this is, uh, there is absolutely no uh, Bluetooth address or, 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 or device name that, uh, that is used is it here to, to determine, uh, to, to find the device, just a service UID. That means if you stop the application uh, and there is another lock of the same brand or same vendor uh, around, you can, uh, your application will connect to this, uh, to this lock. And then we can find bugs and vulnerabilities. Uh, obviously, for many embedded devices, we can look for default passwords and keys. So this is a, a, a low-hanging fruit uh, you can get uh, very easily on uh, embedded Linux systems, for instance. Well, escape shells. Escape shells are good, too. Uh, sometimes buffer overflows, but it's uh, uh, more difficult to exploit. So usually, uh, we, we prefer to rely on the, the, the two uh, first um, type of vulnerability. Uh, also misconfiguration and so on. But here we don't have any file system, any operating system, so we need uh, to, to, to go deeper in the analysis to, to get uh, something valuable. So uh, to summarize uh, this, uh, this smart box, it relies on N1s to generated by the smart box to avoid replay attacks. So this is uh, one point. Uh, second point, it's uh, correctly implemented. This is true AES based encryption using N1s. Uh, so it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, I was not able to break the encryption process. So this, uh, this is correctly implemented. And uh, it's resisted to, to fuzzing. Uh, I, I tried to fuzz the old, the, the old protocol just to, to see if uh, I can trigger uh, a force open uh, to the lock. Uh, I mean, if uh, usually smart locks have a fail open policy. Uh, that means if, if, you, if something goes wrong with the firmware, the smart lock opens. You know, why not? So uh, by, by fuzzing the protocol, it's a way to find this. Uh, but this, uh, this, this didn't work at all. But I, I stumbled upon a very interesting thing when I was reverse engineering the software, which is, and, and the communication itself, uh, which is that the N1s doesn't seem very random to me. So if you have a look at the code, it's just a, a one, and you can see the same thing 
with the uh, BAD communication. So it, normally, this is a, a random value generated to avoid replay attacks. But since it's one and one again, you can just uh, sniff uh, some kind of communication and get an uncooked token and replay it. So this is uh, very interesting. Well, I guess the developer uh, uh, read uh, maybe XKCD too much, but, uh, or just uh, throw dice, I don't know. Uh, but uh, if we got many security issues with this smart box. First one is just we can spoof this smart box. We can create a fake smart box that uh, looks like the original one, since the application does not authenticate the smart box it connects to. So this is the first step. And next step, uh, random n ones is not random at all. So we can predict this value and use it to, to perform a replay attack. So an attacker may spoof the smart box very easily and be able, uh, will be able to, to replay uh, this token. So um, come on, let's go. Let's exploit this, uh, these vulnerabilities. So how to exploit this, these vulnerabilities? Step nine. Uh, we use uh, dedicated software and uh, very specific uh, tools to exploit these vulnerabilities. So the first one uh, is uh, the Blino library uh, written for Node.js, which is a, a very nifty way to, to perform, uh, to, to emulate BAD devices. And uh, I developed an exploit based on our Merkle lab library, which is a library based on Blino that um, is uh, all, the, all the stuff. You don't have to, to write too much JS. To, to get it working. So the, again, this is uh, some kind of code you can find on, on, on our GitHub. So anyway, first, first step, we are also going to spoof the smart lock. And next step, we are going to replace the token. So everything was written in, uh, in JavaScript with Node.js. Uh, so basically, we are mocking the device. We are creating a fake device. The, the application we connect to the device, we are going to send the n ones uh, we obviously know, so the value 1, and get the encrypted token back. And then we are going to replay this token to the smart lock just to, to make sure the, the process uh, of opening the lock or closing the lock uh, is, uh, uh, went well for the, for the user in order to, be st to stay stealth. And then uh, we are going to replay it uh, again and again and again. So let's have a look at, uh, at this attack. So I, I developed a very small exploit. Uh, so it's based on the... Uh, token stored in, on the file system, is with, which uh, is called token.json. And uh, I'm using a small shell script uh, that launches everything. So I'm cre creating a, a mock device, a fake device, uh, for the application to connect to. So obviously, the smart block is, uh, is uh, active uh, right uh, near the phone, but uh, the phone connects to, to my fake device rather than the original one. Then I get the token, replay it, and the smart lock opens. And the fun part in this is that I can replay it again and again and again and make the smart lock open again and again and again, and so on. So once an attacker get this, uh, this token or capture this token, he will be able to, to replay it and make the lock open whenever he wants. So basically, it's uh, what we can call a crypto fail because it's a bad implementation of the N once uh, random generation. So this is uh, it's quite, quite interesting. The m more interesting thing is that the vendor issued a, an update to the firmware. And I did the same with this update. Uh, I did a, a, um, a complete reverse engineering of this, uh, this software. And I found that he, he corrected, he fixed this uh, vulnerability very, very, um, in a very smart way. Uh, so he uses uh, this uh, get run value. Uh, instead of moving just uh, the value one in the in the characteristics, but in fact it relies on the ONG uh, peripheral that is available uh, in the um, Nordic semiconductor chip. So I mean uh, it's, uh, it, it relies on a ver on a correct pseudo random number generator, uh, which is a, a hardware one, not a software one that can be flowed, but um, obviously uh, just a. Uh, the way it should be done on this uh, on this system. So uh, this is uh, quite interesting to me uh, to see that vendors issued uh, a correct fix, uh, uh, a valid fix to this uh, to this stuff. So in conclusion, just to to summarize all of, all of all of this, uh, if concerned, this methodology uh, needs improvement. There is uh, enough space for improvement. Uh, I, I don't pretend to 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 have created the the, uh, the best methodology we can get. But uh, in fact, uh, since um, 
IoT is a, very, is a very wide field. There are a lot, a lot of technologies. There is, I don't think there is only one methodology, methodology that can fit your needs uh, when you are trying to analyze this, uh, these devices. But um, the one I propose, I hope so, uh, will be a, a first step in a, a curated methodology to analyze IoT devices. Uh, I know Rapid7 uh, um, published the, uh, their methodology, or, well, a very a summarize of this methodology, not the complete methodology. But in fact, there is space for improvement. Uh, and the, the cool stuff is that the event are fixed uh, some of the vulnerabilities I, I discovered. Uh, not all of them. Uh, you can still uh, spoof the device if you want, but uh, since uh, the N1's uh, uh, generation is good, you won't be able to perform some kind of replay attacks. So in fact, this is a, this is a, a, a vulnerability that still exists, but uh, this is not uh, very critical. So some pro tips uh, to, if you want to, to analyze IoT stuff. So first one, take your time and document all the things. A lot of people just jumped on uh, UART consoles or UART pins uh, just to, to see, oh, I got a console, it's cool. Yeah, but if you don't um, analyze correctly the PCB, you may miss something. Uh, you, maybe you may miss a, a critical vulnerability, a very easy one to, to spot, but if you, um, if you don't be, uh, if you, um, uh, well, uh, you may miss uh, something. Uh, second, Read data sheets carefully. There are a lot of information in data sheets, and they are uh, all interesting, well, most of them. So if you take some time to read the data sheet, you will avoid a lot of trouble with the CPU architecture, for instance, or so on. So this is very important to, to read data sheets carefully and to learn how to read data sheets. You know, electronics uh, engineers, um, not uh, uh, electronic engineers' mind doesn't um, doesn't work like the the hacker mind. Uh, this is a uh, a bit different. So if you want to learn to how to master Inkscape, if you want to make uh, better drawings like me, it helps a lot. Uh, it could be also useful. And uh, the basic uh, idea from this methodology is to start from the PCB, from the bottom, and go up uh, to the software and the communications. So again, as usual, know your tools and how to use them. Uh, create your own toolbox uh, of uh, your preferred tools and use it. And obviously, share and learn from others. So you can get many cool tricks to, to, to try and, uh, and test, uh, like this one. Uh, I don't know if you know this guy, the Cyber Gibbons. <laughs> so um, he, he was asked a lot of time on, on Twitter how, to, how he was doing these amazing photographies of PCBs. And the answer is, is just using an Epson V600 scanner, just a, a, a optical scanner to, to do this. Uh, uh, most, of, uh, most of people just uh, took pictures from a sm with a smartphone or, or a camera. But uh, in fact, there is an easy way. It costs only three, uh, 300 euros to, to get this, uh, to, to, get the, to buy this scanner, and uh, it works very well if you want to, to, to do clean photographies, uh, for instance. And again, practice. Practice a lot. Uh, Desoldering techniques are not uh, very easy to master. Uh, you need to, a lot of time to, to uh, a lot of, uh, well, to, um, lot of practice to, to get it uh, done well. You know, if you try to disorder with, a, especially with the octagon, uh, which is used for SMD reworks, it's um, yeah, it's not easy the first time, but uh, by doing this a lot of time, it's uh, better and better and so on. Again, use the scope. Yeah, the, the scope is uh, some, uh, some, kind of, some kind of tools um, usually IT people don't, don't know about. Uh, it's a, but it's a very useful tool. You can uh, see what, thing, what the signals look like. You can get a lot of information from this, uh, from this tool. So learn how to use an oscilloscope if you, if you get one. It's a very, very useful tool. But, um, uh, it's uh, not easy to, to, to get uh, our hands on. And of course, and more importantly, try to code or develop automated devices. Try to learn how uh, the engineers are developing software on automated devices because you need to know how they, uh, they do all of this to be able to, to analyze it. It's, uh, such a, it's the same in the IT world. Uh, you can do uh, reverse engineering if you don't know how to code. Um, basically, well, how a compiler works, for instance. So, uh, and if you follow all of this, uh, you will be able to analyze, uh, I guess, a lot of uh, IoT devices with uh, 
uh, without missing something. So if you have uh, any questions, I don't know. Anyone at the back? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, just a quick question about the architectures. Apart from ARM, do you have many architectures you encounter in uh, your reverse engineering projects? Because I guess for IoT, ARM is really predominant. Yeah, a lot of ARM uh, architectures. But, uh, not only, uh, we got MIPS, uh, even Intel, x86, for instance, on some devices. OK, so you don't have to code uh, in IDA, for example. You don't have to record new processor or things like that. You uh, can just use uh, out of the shelf. Uh, so sometimes you have to, to um, create some dedicated files for IDA Pro, for instance, because uh, the CPU is one thing. But uh, there is also uh, a lot of stuff around it, uh, such as uh, dedicated peripherals. Specific registers mapped in memory. So if, uh, if it's not known from the from your disassembler software, you cannot get this information. So uh, sometimes you, you need to to improve the uh, CPU files used by IDA Pro, for instance, to to get it uh, done right. Okay, thank you. Hi. Uh, uh, the question is uh, related to NRF uh, 5222. If uh, the chipset is, uh, comes with uh, CPR protection, code protection read, yeah. so how you can bypass uh, in that oh, case? It's quite easy on the Nordic Semiconductor chip. There is a bypass, non-bypass, to, uh, to exploit it. Uh, basically, we use the debugging interface. Uh, when the code with that protection is enabled on this, uh, on this chip, uh, basically, you cannot read the flash from the flash. So if you're, you're, if you're using OpenCD, for instance, and use the dump image command, it won't work. But if you can use uh, some kind of, uh, of uh, return-oriented programming technique uh, by using uh, registers. I, um, I, I don't think I have uh, enough time uh, here to, to explain it in, de in details, but there is okay. a bypass that can be used to extract the firmware. It takes more time to, to get it, but it's possible. But it's possible on uh, NRF 52, right? 51 and 52, I guess. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Have you tested any other devices where you've come across where uh, the Bluetooth, uh, the nuance as part of the Bluetooth encryption hmm? uh, was actually set badly like that? Or is this kind of one of the first ones you've come across? I'm yeah. just trying to figure out how prevalent that is. Yeah, we got some devices that use a, a pairing uh, in the Bluetooth Low Energy Protocol, but uh, uh, you, it's more difficult to sniff these uh, this communications uh, because it's encrypted. Uh, sometimes you get the just box pairing, pairing used, so um, it's um, easier to sniff and crack the encryption and then decrypt all the communication. But in fact, um, we had to develop some dedicated, uh, dedicated hardware to, to get it. So this is uh, obviously my subject, uh, the subject of my talk I submitted uh, at DEF CON this year and that got accepted. So uh, more information to come at DEF CON, I guess. <laughs> Nice talk, thank you. Um, my question was about the methodology and the order of the steps. Um, step seven, I think, was sniffing the traffic between the object and the application. Yeah. Um, my question was more, why is this happening at step seven and not earlier? Because in this case, and it, it might be a, a particular case, but um, you could have retrieved the nonce probably from sniffing the network even yes. without reversing. So why do you make it this way, just yeah, a question. Yeah, this is a very good point. And uh, the fact is, um, I, I wanted to, to have a, a very uh, great, good idea of the, of the big picture, you know, uh, how it works, how, how, the, how the components interact or, or communicate with, the, uh, with the, it shows us. So uh, I, I could have uh, analyzed this, uh, this BAD communication and spotted this, but I, I won't, um, I, um, 
I, w uh, I wouldn't be able to turn that, the, to say that, or to determine that the uh, one value used uh, on a very specific character is, is n ones if I didn't reverse uh, all, the, all the software. Uh, so get, uh, get my, getting my hands on the software before analyzing communications is for me um, a good way to, uh, to understand more precisely how things work. You know, because uh, if you just analyze the communication, of course, you, you, you may find something or find a vulnerability, but you won't be able to tell why it's working. So, so the, um, the sniffing is the ends on and the firmware is the proof, kind of? Exactly. Uh, in, the, in this case, with the smart log, uh, I was able to, to say to the vendor, OK, there is a vulnerability. This uh, impacts the N ones you are using. And obviously, your code is wrong, because you are just putting one in this uh, characteristics. OK, thanks. It's OK. It's OK. No more questions. Thank you all for attending.